Praise the Lord. Amen. No, really, because all, all this protest about kneeling and standing at a football game that's, you know, kind of has gone on and on. Uh, if, if, they, if you really want to get some people upset, go to the classroom when the anthem come on. Those kids don't stand. They don't stand up. They be popping gum and talking. And see, in my class, you know, I was, I'm a veteran, Air Force veteran. I made them all stand. Stand up. You better get up. I don't have to get up. Yes, you do get up. I'll tell you about it later. Right. So, but you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, but I would tell them, hey man, you really should stand. Or you really should stand. So anyway, so, so I, I said all that to say, when I was in San Antonio, I, I was teaching, a, I taught culinary arts, and I had a Russian exchange student. I've told some of you this story. And uh, w she had a project that she had to do. That was part of the exchange program. They had to do a big project. And she had to, she's going to make some Russian stew for us. And I was like, okay, okay. I was all excited. And I, so I had to find all these exotic stuff for this stew. So uh, I found everything that I could, but she needed one item that we couldn't find was grape leaves. Now, I don't know if you've ever cooked with grape leaves, but I have never cooked with grape leaves. Now, I'm from the South. I've seen grape leaves from a, from a um, uh, you know, being on the vines, but I've never like, seen them in the store where people sell them. Matter of fact, I looked at almost every major specialty store in San Antonio. I had a Russian population, so it wasn't like a Russian store, but I looked and I couldn't find it. And so finally I told her, I said, sweetie, listen, you're just going to have to make that stew without the grape leaves. So she made it, and it was time for everybody to taste it. And we tasted it all, and it was like, okay, what was that? No, I'm joking. <laughs> we, said, we said, oh, that's, that was good, not bad, not bad. And she said, she said to us, she said, um, the, it was the, the, the grape leaves would have really given it that distinct taste that would have really made it good. And I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. She said, it's that one missing ingredient sometimes that just throws everything off. And then so, so as I was preparing this message, I thought about that when it comes to our lives. It doesn't matter what we add to it. It doesn't matter how precious it is to us. It, our lives are still com incomplete without God. We're just like that stew that she made. It's something missing. Listen, we can add the best this world has to offer, but without God, we're still incomplete. Matter of fact, I, something changed. You guys know my, my brother, I lost my brother. I don't say I lost him. He went home to be with the Lord. My brother's only 54 years old. He had a, he had a, a, a heart attack. It was sudden and unexpected, and so it kind of shocked our family. And um, I was, when I went, prior to me going, prior to me him even dying, my prayer time changed and and something happened i would go in when i prayed instead of asking god for a whole bunch of stuff i would just go in there and sit in the presence of god i wasn't saying much i wasn't asking for a bunch of things i wasn't praying for my kids and you know my cousin them i wasn't doing none of that i was just sitting in the presence of the lord and while i was sitting in the presence something just kind of happened and something just kind of it was as if god was pouring himself inside of me. And see, what this ice represents, this ice represents my life and our lives. And if I let this ice melt, it wouldn't be enough to quench the thirst that life gives me. It wouldn't be enough. So as I'm sitting in God's presence, I just felt like he was pouring himself inside of me. It was just, it was just me and him and surrender and silence. I wasn't saying much. He was pouring. And everything I needed, I was getting out of those moments. Everything I needed, I was getting out of those moments of silence. Just sitting in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes I'd have music on, sometimes I didn't. I'd just sit there. And I'd say, God, whatever you want me to know, tell me today. And then I found out my brother passed away, which was a shock. Right? And so as I, I sat there, I said, Lord, you know, as I found out, I said, Lord, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a certain kind of way. What do I do? He said, the same thing you always be doing. Just come back to my presence and let me pour into you. And so listen, here's what happens. See, this is our lives, right? The ice represents our lives. We, it's not enough. Somebody say not enough. It doesn't matter what you do. You can add the best of the best of this world. It's not enough. You're still incomplete without God. 
Why? Because he created you to be in a relationship with him. Now, this this whole uh, series we're doing, if you're visiting with us, it's, it's called Covenant Pursuit. That means God is pursuing you. He's coming after you. He's telling you, hey, I want relationship with you. It's real simple, okay? And so, as I was saying, this ice represented our lives, and it wasn't not enough to quench life's thirsty, thirst. No matter what you do, it'll never be enough. You can, you can go to the best school, not enough. You can go to the, you can have the best car, not enough. You can have the, you can have four or five girlfriends or boyfriends. That's why you got four or five, right? Because not enough. Right? So listen, so, so what God does, his, 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 his whole desire, man, he is so amazing, first of all. But his whole desire, because what's going to happen is this ice is going to melt. And this ice and this water now become what? One. Y'all got it. Y'all got it. And I told you this was an AP class. This is an AP class. Just in case you didn't know, this is an AP class, praise the Lord. All right? So, so what's going to happen? This ice is going to melt, and you're going to become one with God. One with him. Never ever being able to separate away from him. That's our lives with God. You can never separate from him. Right? So what happens is he fills us up, we become one. And here's some of the here's one of the problems we made. Let, baby, let me have that water bottle that's next to you. Yeah. Don't open it. Don't open it. You gotta open it. Listen, here, here's what we try to do is that we try to take our lives. This represents your friends, your girlfriend, all right, your best friend, you understand? <laughs> we try to take all of our problems and give it to them. We try to pour it into them. They can't handle it. Yeah. No, but the only person can handle your life is the one who gave it to you. You see that? He's the only one that can handle your life. Right, and so when you when you empty and you feel like oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and I'm on, uh, I'm just depressed, and I'm gonna have anxiety, you have to go back to him, so he can do this to you. He can pour himself back into you, and you can become one with him. So you don't need drugs. Now you, you know what I'm saying. I'm talking about illegal drugs. Now medications you might need. You know, keep taking it. Praise God. No, you have to tell people that because people are like the pastor said stop taking medication. So I'm not. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> but no, listen. So this is what we are. We we become one with Him. That's His desire. And so what we've talked about in this whole teaching session sessions is that listen, He comes with us, but not just a certain way. But He comes in this way of called covenant. He wants to. He comes after us, and He's serious about it. Anybody had somebody come after them? They were serious. When I came after my wife, I was serious. She couldn't handle that seriousness. You understand? She just <laughs> she couldn't handle my phone call. I said, "What's up, girl? How you doing?" I threw that very white voice on her, girl. What's up? What's up? <laughs> I'm lying. I was begging. The girl's begging. Please don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. She was begging too. I was like, later though. Later. Later though. Later. <laughs> But see, I got her. See, see, see what happened was, see, I got her, man, because cause I was trying real hard, and she was, she was giving me the boy. She was blowing me off like crazy. And I, was, I said, okay, let's just go to lunch. I'll think about it. Think about it? What? Girl, it's just lunch. I mean, I'm not trying to marry you. I just want to go to lunch. And she said, I'll think about it. Okay. So, so, I, so I called her on her job one day, and, and uh, her supervisor answered the phone. I said, yes, may I speak to Airman Blendman, please? She says, oh, sure. She said, are you the one she's been talking about? I said, shuck her now, shuck her now. <laughs> I got her, I got her, I got her. So I got her, she got on the phone. I said, I'll be there at 11, pick you up. You be ready. Because I got you. You've been talking about me. Right? But listen, God's the same way, man. He pursues after you. He comes after you in his own way that you know he's trying to get your attention. Right? We, we saying it's a covenant. It's a covenant agreement that he, want, he wants with you. In other words, let's, let's look at your notes. Uh, uh, he, he, he wants this thing. It's a binding agreement. All right? So first of all, let me ask you this. So why does he come after us? Because uh, he doesn't want our lives to ever be empty again. God doesn't want you walking around in your life like this. Empty. You ain't, ain't nothing going on. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Everything is so bad. <sighs> you know, somebody said something I didn't like. <laughs> and God is saying, 
really? Really? Here I am. Just come and I'll fill you up. So you will never, 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 never have to be begging again. You don't have to, you don't have to beg Leroy for his number. You'll be begging Leroy. Please, Leroy, call me. No. Leroy I ain't calling you. Um. You see that? So, listen. He comes after us a certain way so that we'll never have to be empty again. Listen, these are covenant words. Jesus said like this. He told the woman at the well, I don't know if you guys know it from me with the story, but let me just tell you. He was, he was, he, there was they were passing through Samaria, and the woman was at the well, and, and she was getting water. And Jesus said, hey, can, can you give me some of that water? And she said, oh, and she went through a whole litany of things about why she was going to give him the water and all this type of thing. And he said to her, listen, if you give me that water, you'll never drink, you'll never thirst again. Oh, my God. What? So that's, listen, that's the person who's pursuing you so that you'll never ever thirst again. You'll never ever, your life will never ever look like this. Never. But you'll always look like this. I mean, wouldn't you like a nice cold glass of water? Yes. No, listen, this is our lives with God, man. A nice big cold glass. So, so people will come to you and say, hey, what you drinking? What you drinking? Y'all been to a bar when folks say, what you drinking? You know what I mean? You know what you, that's how God wants. He wants your life to be like, hey, what you drinking? <sighs> so I got to review. Come on, I got to review because I got to catch some people up just in case so we can talk about this covenant God that comes after you. All right, y'all ready? First of all, we said a covenant that God comes after. It's a, it's, a, it's a binding agreement between two people. All right? Which they agree to do this. We think they agree to protect, promote, and prosper each other. All right? It's protect, promote, and prosper each other. Now, it's real simple. God, we're talking about a guy named Abraham. Everybody know who Abraham is? If you don't know who Abraham, he was, he was the guy that after Adam and Eve messed it all up and man went crazy and Noah built an ark and God you know, allowed everything to, be, to die in the flood. He came back with one guy said, Abraham, I'm going to start all over. I'm going to introduce the world through you, Abraham. So all we're doing was following Abraham's plight to see how God was interacting with him because the same way he did Abraham, he did you. So he went to he went to hey uh, what was it what was it called um the land Haran Haran to to get Abraham he went to the club to get you praise the Lord he went to the club to get me so I ain't, I ain't, I ain't tripping <laughs> anyway praise the Lord so listen so so but but he comes at us and he says I want a binding agreement with you I want an agreement that's so serious that you absolutely positively know who I am and your life will never ever look like this again. Never walk around looking, searching, searching all kind of stuff. Why? No, you don't have to. Why? Because he wants to fill you up and show you who he is. All right. So y'all, y'all still here? All right. Now we talked about this covenant agreement. We said that there is, it's, there's. I said phases. I said two types. There's really, there are phases, but two types of covenant. It is one is unconditional and one is conditional. Okay. I mean, I am a un- I am in a unconditional conditional marriage. What's that mean? It was unconditional. I love her unconditionally. I do. And I think she does me the same, but it's conditional. She better not be talking about that. Come on now. Who wants a relationship that you, you don't know if the person's cheating or not? You don't know if they're going to come home or not. You begging them to come home. Please, honey, just come home tonight. Please. I miss you. I'm lost without you, honey. No, nah, man. Who wants that? <laughs> Can you imagine we giving that to God? That's how some of us do God. He don't know where you come in going. He doesn't know. Praise the Lord. All right. No, because you got to understand, it starts out unconditional. There's nothing you can do to earn his, his come after you. I'll call it his come after. There's nothing you can do to earn his rap. Because God raps, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing you can do. He did it because he loves you. you. You don't have to be perfect. No matter what you've done, doesn't matter. He comes after you. But then he makes it conditional. He says, listen, you're going to be in a relationship with me? i can got to show you how. Because I am the man. All right, all right, then listen, why does, God, why does God offer us a covenant agreement? Because he had to save mankind from themselves. Listen, whether you believe it or not, God will have to save you from yourself. But you don't understand, I'm a good person. I had a guy one time, I was in the military, and I had just gave my life to Christ, man. I was growing, and I, I, he, I said to him, I was talking to him about his relationship with God. He said, hey, man, no, I don't need that. I'm good. I, I'm a good person. I don't need that. I, I've never killed anybody. I've never done anything wrong. I, never done. I said, where were you at last night? He said, why are you asking? Why are you asking? And I told him, I said, listen, if you've, if you've broke one, you've broke them all. you broke them all. And I said, the only way, man, listen, the, God has to rescue us from us. 
Because we, we read this in, in Genesis 11 is when, you know, the people had, they were at that time on the earth, there was only one voice, one language. They were all speaking the same language. And because they were so arrogant and they still needed God, they decided they're going to build this tower up. Y'all remember that? And they was going to go to the tower and, and they're going to build the tower up to God. And God had to come down and he, he divided their tongues. He, or he, divide, he broke up the languages and everybody have a different language now. Now listen, <sighs> that great division, without God, we are still a people divided. We can't even come together. Listen, you put five people in the room together, at some point, there's going to be a fight. It's called your family, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. It, it won't take long. It won't take long. Just one person will be like, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we're, not here. we're divided. That's why he comes in covenant. He comes in covenant. He says, I'm going to bind myself to you, and I'm going to show you how not to divide yourselves among. How to get along. And then last, again, we're, we're just reviewing. Somebody said reviewing. All right, we learn that this covenant agreement is a covenant agreement centered around your needs. Somebody say my needs. And see, we talked about this last week. The hook of the covenant. What does God use to pull you in to make you really believe? It's the hook. See, as I said last week, he stands, and, and we, we kind of, let me just go over it again. You, you have needs. And when God comes and says, I want relationship with you, he comes to stand as the person overseeing your needs. What does that mean? That means he's in charge to make sure that your needs are being met, that every one of your needs are met. That's it. At the same time, you're part of the covenant agreement is we stand proxy for his needs here on earth. Yes, God has needs. What are those needs? Listen real careful. God loves people. And the only way he's going to reach people is through me and you. So he wants to be the overseer of your needs. He wants you to be the overseer of his needs. It's called covenant. But he has to use something to hook you, to make you believe and truly believe that he's over your needs and he wants you over his, over his needs. He needs to hook you. And that's what he did with Abraham. He used Abraham's needs to hook him. So today we're going to talk about, in the next couple minutes, we're going to talk about the mark of the covenant. See, because again, whenever two people cut covenant, there had to be a sign. There had to be proof that there was a, there was a covenant. Me and my wife been married, I told y'all, 26 years, right? And our proof of marriage is a ring. The ring. It's proof. That's, that's proof mark of the covenant. And see, for, for us, the proof of the covenant is our rings, then our lives, emotionally, physically, sexually, all of that. It's proof that we are in covenant with one another. And the same thing happened to God. There has to be proof that you're in covenant with God. There's a mark that you're, we're marked proving that we have a relationship with God and that we're one with him. All right? Just like Abraham. So now we're going to go back. Can we go back to Abraham and, and, and talk about him? This, this is, Ab this is uh, Genesis, not yes, Genesis, the 20th chapter, sorry, 17th chapter, 9th verse. It says, then, then God said to Abraham, your responsibility, now listen, he's trying to get the mark of the covenant. Man, I'm waiting, running out of time. Dad got me. Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and your, all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Listen to this. Each male among you must be circumcised. Yeah, you'll get that on the way home. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day of, after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of the everlasting covenant, and male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off of the covenant family for breaking the covenant. All right, so number one, what's the, the purpose of the mark that God told Abraham about? It was for identification. All right, he told, Adam, he told Abraham, Abraham, proof that me and you have this relationship, I want you to circumcise yourself. Now, I ain't never been to a church where they talk about circumcision, but we're going to talk about circumcision today. Praise the Lord. All the guys are like this. We really have to talk about that? <laughs> Seriously, brother? No, but really, we, we, um, 
First of all, I, as I was thinking about this, I said, man, was that a mistake? But no, it, it wouldn't because the Bible says that when God created Adam and Eve, and Adam, he said he created everything good and Adam was not circumcised. So everything, it was, it was God's way. But when he gets to Abraham, he says, Abraham, man, I want you to circumcise yourself so that it will be mark of the covenant. It will be proof when people come to you to know who you are and who you belong with, they'll be able to identify you by the mark of the covenant. But there was one problem. There was one problem. See, I would have raised my hand at that point. Because, see, Abraham didn't negotiate with God. He negotiated with Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, hey, if you can find just ten people. Now, first he said 100, then he said, then went down 50, then went down to 10. He said, if you can find 10, can you, see, that was a time to negotiate right there. You know what I'm saying? Abraham, all the guys would be like, can we just, re can we renegotiate that? So anyway, uh, he tells him, he said, uh, uh, I want you to, to circumcise all the males. So why in the world would God, why would that, it's even important to God that a man be circumcised to be, uh, uh, be in relationship with him and to, and to use it as identification? You can't see it if you, somebody walk up you're just vulnerable because what happens is come come baby real quick so remember how me and, me and Leslie did our, our, our thing how she that's her clan this is my clan we cut, covenant, we cut animals up we laid them aside and we, we switched sides so now she's in charge of my needs and I'm in charge of her needs we're in covenant but the proof that we have covenant is that we have to mark each other with a mark Right? We will mark it the same place. So if anybody saw the marking of, let's say she's a Philistine, um, Abraham. She's a Philistine. We'll mark the Philistine mark here and the Philistine mark here. And then I'll give them the Abrahamic mark here. And, she, and, she, and I'll receive it the same one. And that would tell other people around us that, hey, I'm in covenant with the Philistines. So if you fight me, you got to fight the Philistines. The problem is, is that God told Abraham, your mark will be in your private area and nobody sees it. But you will use it for identification. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? That's the dumbest thing you ever want to. <laughs> no, really, because remember, the place where Abraham lived, there was no laws. We, don't, we have laws and policemen that go by the laws. There was none of that. He was, he was a dead man walking without covenant. But God says, okay, I won't cut covenant, and this is what we're going to do. All right, you, thank you. Thank you, Vanna. Praise, praise you. All right. Right, so listen, here's why. Here, here's why God told Abraham circumcision. Here's why. The next point, listen. Because his, because a people that is dependent on God, all right? So what that, what that means? <sighs> Abraham's identification was he would be a people that would be dependent on God from his very beginning to the very end. Because you, you got to understand something. In those days when circumcision, they didn't have like anesthesia like we have it. So when they circumcised, they, you know, you can't put alcohol everywhere. So they didn't, their, their anesthesia wasn't quite like ours. You, know, you understand? So if a man is circumcised, he's down for some time. Matter of fact, uh, uh, one of Jacob's, two of Jacob's sons tricked another clan when he was cutting covenant with them. And, and he said, okay, we'll cut covenant, but you got to circumcise all the men. And they said, okay, we'll circumcise. And they circumcised all the men. And while they were circumcised, they went in and killed them all. Why? Because they were so vulnerable. So what is God, why did God ask Abraham to use circumcision? Here's why. Because he wanted a people to be totally dependent on him. And you cannot, listen to me very careful, you cannot reach a life full of God depending on yourself. And that's what he was telling Abraham. He says, use circumcision because I want you to depend. You want this life, Abraham? You want this? I need you to depend strictly on me. So if I'm going to reach where God wants me to go, I can't do it in my own strength. You see that? This is why we're in covenant with him. I can't reach the places God wants me to go. I can't reach the people God wants me to do it in my own strength. And cir the circumcision meant his, his strength. But if I'm going to reach and do what God wants me to do, I have to do it out of my relationship with him. Praise the Lord. I thought I got a better amen on that. No, listen, because now, mind you, Abraham was over 75 at this time. So there was no need for him to circumcise himself. Y'all to get that on the way home. <laughs> there was no need. But listen, what, what it represents for us is our own way of doing things. We depend on certain things. We depend on certain people. We depend on our degrees. We depend, all that stuff. You should get them. That's great. We'll help you get them. All that's wonderful. But when in God's economy, he don't want you to be that to be your strength. He wants your relationship with him to be your strength. That's what he wants. How are you identified? Well, I'm identified by the things I own. 
I'm identified by what I do. I am who I am because, no, no, no. I am who I am because of my relationship with God. I told you all the story where I used to work in, when I was in corporate and I went to my boss. We had flew into New Orleans. I think it was New Orleans. And we were at one of them big horny torty, uh, uh, big horny torty uh, 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 events. It was a big banquet. Very, very rich people. I mean, it was, it was just some rich people in there. And you walked in, and it was like, whoo, whoo, these some rich people. And they're driving up in all kinds of cars. They got, they got chauffeurs. And so I'm in there with my boss, and we just kind of mingling. And, and uh, I'm talking to people. You know, I'm just talking to people. I'm, I'm shaking their hand, looking eye to eye. And this guy said, hey, man, what, what, what do you do? I said, well, I, I work for him. He looked at me and said, oh, you were on here. I said, oh, no. No, okay, I like you. And what he was saying, well, how are you so confident? How do you do? Uh, here's why. Because of my relationship with God. And, and my identification comes through him. Not through my flesh. And that's what circumcision may emit your own strength. You cannot make it in life, succeeding in life, in your own strength. <sighs> Come on. Somebody say the mark of the covenant. All right, let's. The next point. Two more points, we're done. The next mark of the covenant, again, we want proof, right? Oh, I got to go back. I'll tell you this story. Hold on. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is Genesis, the 20th chapter, 6th verse. Let me, share, let, me, let me show you how, how faithful God is to the agreement he makes with you. Abraham messed up. No, Abraham lied. I know you've never done that, but Abraham lied. He did. He told a lie, man. And, and you would think God, who is, you know, God and holy and all that, like we say he is, all that good stuff, right? You would think he'd be like, Abraham, man. What you doing? You 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 got the covenant. What, why are you? Why would you lie? But he got he was weak. You know how you strong in some areas and weak in others. Yeah. You you might be strong in the area of you know you just believe God. You get sick. You just believe God. I believe God's going to heal me. I'm going to be okay. It's all right. Yes, but you might be real. You might not have that kind of faith when it comes to money. You hold it on like this. Dear God, <laughs> Pastor, please don't ask for none. Well, Abraham Abraham was like that when it came to protection. He had great faith to believe God, but when it came to protection, he had a little weak spot. Let, let me just show you. It, it says, now this is what happened. He lied because Sarah was, Sarah was 75 and she was very good looking. She's a fine lady, right? And, and he told her, every, he twice, he said, he said, we're going to go here and they're going to come after you because you're so fine, girl. And, and, and they did. But Abraham lied to the man and told him that he was his sister. Well, he, they wouldn't really lie. He was his stepsister, but, you know, he used it. He wasn't supposed to use it. Right? So listen, this is verse 6. It says, in the dream, God responded to, he talked to the king. Yes, I know you are innocent. Because the king to, God to, went to the king and said, hey, king, what you doing, man? Th that woman's in covenant with me. Because God promised to protect them. And he said, the king said, hey, man, she, he told me she was his sister. He said, yeah, I know. I know you're innocent. But let's, let's, let's see what he says. He said, yes, I know you're innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against her, against me. And why did I not, and why did not allow, let you touch her? Now, first of all, he said, you're sinning against who? So who was in, was, was God in that room? Yeah, he was there, but he talked to her, but he wasn't in the bed. What was he talking about? He was talking about Sarah, but he was in covenant with Sarah. So if you sin against Sarah, you sin against... So now return the woman to her husband, and he will pray for you, for he is a prophet. Then you will live. But if you do not return, him, return her to him, you can be assured that you and all your people will what? They're going to die. You see that? So now listen to me. Here's why I said the identification of the covenant is so important because God keeps his covenant. He keeps his covenant with you even when you're imperfect. Even when you can't do your part. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't. He never will leave you like this again when your life is empty. Never. Why? Because he stands over your needs and whatever you need, he'll give it to you. He'll make sure you have it. So they lied and did all that and God said, oh no. That's fine. I know he messed up. But my job is I'm going to protect him so you better not touch her. Somebody say the mark of the covenant. All right. Next, the mark of the covenant. The second mark of the covenant is obedience. Somebody say obedience. And all that is is, is you surrendering everything you have to God. Everything you possess, you, you make it available to God. It's real simple. Listen, the scripture says this. It's Genesis 17, 9. It says, then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. All right? Uh, now, so our next point is this. Listen. So as I said, obedience is this. It's a surrender. It's you opening your hands and your life to God and say, hey, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Whatever you want. 
That's it. So how do we know we're in covenant today for us that you're in covenant with God? It's how obedient you are to the teaching of the scriptures. That's how people will know. How are people going to know? It's because your obedience. I told you about the story when I, I had a guy who um, I was I was worked with in corporate in, in, in San Antonio. And, you know, he, he had his way of living and all that. And he, he I, never, I never said anything about Jesus to him. I never witnessed to him. I never told him he was going to hell. And none of that. We just had a good working relationship. But my family would come. Leslie would come and she would bring the kids. They were young. And he, he, we used to call him ghosts. So he, my kids used to call him ghosts because he used to scare them, first of all. And he, he, was, he was from Wisconsin, so he was really, really pasty, right? And I said, I said, man, stop scaring my kids. And I said, they, they, they call you ghosts. And he was like, I like that name. <laughs> but he was, he was, we were really good friends, and, uh, but I never witnessed to him at one time. And he would always come to me and say, man, I admire your family. How, how, what, what was touching his heart? Our obedience to God. That's it. My simple obedience to God. So our, our next part is this. Listen, in this covenant agreement, it's, it's not because we have to be obedient. No. It's proof that we know him. It's proof that we know who God. My obedience to God is proof that I know him. Because the scripture says, if I'm in disobedience, then I truly don't know him. It's simple. Like my wife, you know, we were in this, this love relationship. And how I know her we spent so much time together and I know that lady you can come to me and say hey your wife did this I'm like no that's not her why because I know her why because we walked together for all these years God's the same way someone can say to you hey God did this your response should be yes or no according to the scriptures no that wasn't God why because he doesn't do that because your obedience your obedience to him you get to know him right listen Abraham the proof Abraham had Abraham circumcised himself now that's some craziness right there. You understand? You have some craziness right up in there. I mean, listen, I would have fucked that test right there. I'd be like, okay, now listen, I just I can't do that one. No, I'm sorry. I ain't, kind of I ain't got that kind of faith. But that's why I'm bringing it up, and I know it's kind of you say, why are you talking about things in church? But here's why, and I know it's kind of extreme, but you gotta understand how God introduced Himself, and He was asking Him to do some of the most extreme things. And every time he would do it, God would prove himself again to this man. I mean, it was, ooh. who at the age of 75 circumcised himself? He did it. Why? Listen, because it was proof to everybody around him that God existed. That God existed. So, and your obedience is the same way. Your obedience to God is proof that everybody in your family, what? That God exists. And you're in relationship. And not just, a, not just any old relationship. No, but it's a binding agreement. He has like bound himself to me. I can get myself in some trouble. Well, he ain't leaving me. My friends might walk off. Even my family, my, even my, 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 my parents might walk off. But guess what? God ain't going nowhere. <laughs> he ain't going nowhere. I love Joyce Myers' testimony. I don't know if you know who Joyce Myers is, but let me tell you, Joyce Myers is a is a TV evangelist. Uh, well, they call her that, but she's an evangelist. I love her teaching. But she her, she was she was raped by her father over two hundred times. Over two hundred times. But later in her life, God was able to use her obedience to bring her relationship back with her father and her mother. Put them in a place where they can get care at the later years of their life, and she and she took care of her dad in the last years of her life. How does that happen? Obedience. Or she could have walked around the rest of her life like this, but God said, "No, no, 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 no. Let me fill you up. And when I fill you up, the hard things that you say you couldn't do, you can do them. Why? Because I live on the inside of you. So you can circumcise yourself. I pray, Lord." No, I'm joking. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't try that. Pastor said. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. So again, let, let me tell you one, one more point about, about this obedience thing. Because again, we're talking about proof. Somebody say proof. Our obedience is proof of his activity in the world. How does the world still know that God exists? Listen. He uses our obedience. So yesterday when we went down to feed the people, uh, the homeless people, we fed over 200 people. They need to know that God is still, he knows they're there. And he uses our activity, you all, our obedience to let people know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm here. 
I'm still active. I still love. I didn't just love in the Bible and cl closed up. No, 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 no. But he wants, he has to use the people that's in charge of his needs. And that's us. <sighs> Somebody said Mark of the Covenant. L come on. Last but not least. Oh, man. Okay. Last, last point here. The Mark of the Covenant is faith. The extreme aversion. Yeah. The extreme version. See, listen, if you're in relationship with God, I just got to, I want to surprise you now. If you're not, if you just to say, well, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure. He's going to cause you to believe some stuff that's extreme. But he took Abraham on a journey now. He, I ain't got time to go back, but he took him on a journey. He first in, in, introduced himself to him and he made him this big promise. He says, I'm going to be your God and I'll protect you and all those things. And then he says, okay, here's proof of it. I need you. I, I want you to be, you know, we're going to mark each other. You need to circumcise yourself. That's extreme, right? Yeah. That's extreme, right? And, and, and he says, yeah, oh, Abraham, uh, now there's something else I want, I want you to do. It's going to take even more faith. So that last point, the mark of the covenant is faith. It is faith. Now, when we meet Abraham, oh, man, when we meet Abraham, first of all, he's 75 years old. Somebody say 75. When he's introduced in the scriptures, he's 75. And what I was taught, see, I went to Catholic seminaries, so you know, it was really good, too. I went to a Catholic seminary, and I learned a whole lot from a lot of people from different cultures. And, and one of the things I learned that whatever culture got you first usually has you. So usually people that are Catholic, they say Catholic all their lives. If people are Lutheran, they say Lutheran all their lives, unless there's a, ma a major change in their lives. But most of the time, whoever gets you, got you. Abraham was a moon worshiper. He was a moon worshiper. And when God knocked on his door and said, hey, I want a relationship with you, the Bible says that Abraham believed. So God's whole pursuit after you is one thing and one thing only. He wants you to believe. Simple. To get from here to here. <laughs> Somebody say, I want that, boy. I can't wait till church is over. <laughs> Listen, it's one thing. Believe. Will you believe? So, let's read the scripture. So, sometime later, we ain't got time. Can I just tell the story? Y'all can read when y'all get home. Sometime later, God comes to Abraham. He said, okay, Abraham, you got this thing down now because God promised Abraham a son. It took him a whole 25 years to get that son. 25 years, but he got it. After those 25 years, God tells him, say, hey, listen, take your son. Let's go worship. He said, okay. He said, I want you to sacrifice him to me. In other words, kill him. Bring him to me. So they, they went mar they marching up the mountain. God is, is, Abraham said, when God told him, guess what Abraham said? All right, let's go. <laughs> my man. Uh, he's my man. So Abraham gets up. He, gets, he tells his servants, y'all come on, get the wood, get the rope. Come on, we going, where we going? We going, we going to worship. We going to the mountain to worship. All right, good. They all walking. Isaac is right beside him. That's his son. They're walking. And they walk and they get to the place. He tells the servants. He tells the servants. He knew they couldn't handle it. He left him. He said, hey, y'all stay right here. We'll be back. Me and the son, me and my boy, going to worship. Y'all got it? You see how faith was already working? See, listen, Abraham got it along the way. He got it along the way when he had to circumcise himself. He got it along the way when he lied, and then God bailed him out. Right? He got it along the way. Now he had the biggest extreme test he's ever had, his faith. The boy that God said that all the promises are going to come through him, God is telling him, sacrifice him, kill him. And Abraham said, Roger that. Let's go. They're walking up the mountain. Isaac said to Abraham, hey, we've done this before, Dad. Where's the, where's the, uh, where's the sacrifice? Abraham looks at Isaac and said, the Lord will provide. Let's go. He walks up the mountain. They get to the place of worship. He tells his son, lie down, son. I can't imagine what's going through Isaac's head. My dad has lost his mind. He is senile. He looked back, I can't call for help because it's just me and him. And plus, he got the knife, so I guess it's over with me. He lays down. He ties the man up. He ties him up. He's got him ready to sacrifice him to God because God told him. Now, at first, they thought Abraham was a little lunar. You know, Abraham, you lost it because he left his family. He left everything to follow God. Now, he's about to sacrifice his son. Abraham takes the knife. He's getting ready to stab the boy. And God, the angel of the Lord, says to him, Abraham, Abraham, don't touch him. Why? Because he says... Your faith. He, listen, listen to what God says to him. He said, Abraham, your faith. I see your faith. And your faith has made you right with me. It, Abraham got to a point 
where he was willing to believe God for any and every. So here's the point. If he would have killed Isaac right there, Abraham's faith was that God was going to raise him from the dead. You know why? Because along the way, everything God said, it came to pass. Everything he said, it came to pass. Everything he said, it came to pass. And so this was the mark of the covenant for Abraham. For us, it's the same thing. God's going to ask you to do some extreme things. Some crazy thing, like leave Texas, sell everything you got, come to Georgia, start a church. What? Who does that? Life was good. I told you I was eating breakfast tacos. It was good. But God said, extreme, do the extreme things. I did. I'm going to stop. I, I, can I pick this up next week? We're going to stop right there. But listen, I, I told you all this story before. It bears repeating. I got to tell it again. We were sitting in church. I had lost my big corporate job, making big money. I lost it. I ain't have nothing else. And we, we, our business we started was making no money. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it was circling the drain. And then the economy collapsed in 2007 and it flushed. And so we had $900 in the bank. My kids were in private school. I had no money. I couldn't pay my rent, nothing. And I was sitting behind this couple. It was a young couple. And God said to me, give them $500. I started laughing like Abraham did. Really? <laughs> Are you serious? I ain't got but nine. You want me to give five away? I mean, I'm sitting there just like y'all sitting. He says, give it. I said to my wife, and now this was the time for her to disagree. She didn't disagree. I was hoping for a fight. <laughs> I was hoping she would say, are you out your mind? And I would say, God, you out your mind because you see she. But real quick, she says, whatever God tells you to do, do it. I gave that couple. I wrote a check, $500. I gave it to him. Handed it to him. He was, he, I didn't know this until later, he wanted to go home and be with his family. He couldn't afford it. And one of his, I think one of his, I think his father, somebody was sick. He needed to get there. And I gave him that check. He was stunned. Oh, my God. So he was like, man, I said, hey, man, I told God told me to do it. The next day, I had, I'll tell you, we were about to close our business. My business partner walked in, handed me a check for $5,000. But see, God will test your faith. He'll test your faith. He'll see. Do you really believe me? Prove it. Let me show you. And then every time he'll, he'll do his part. He just wants you to do your part. Stand to your feet. We're going to close with that.